Do not exalt yourself, or you will be humbled. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's probably nothing too strange to be on television, particularly if we call it reality TV. But it is hard to imagine a hit show of America's most humble person. I mean, think about it for a minute. Rather than an American Idol or some other pop show like that, what would that look like? Anybody here remember reading David Copperfield by Charles Dickens at some point in their lives? Yeah, it used to be sort of standard in the high school English curriculum. That's kind of passe now. But if you remember David Copperfield, you remember the character Uriah Heep. It wasn't just an English rock band in the 70s. Uriah Heep was this kind of obsequious character who was a nemesis of David Copperfield, and his favorite thing to say was, what an humble man I am, sir. He was obsequious precisely in how he would continually claim his humility. And humility is not just something that we can put on and claim. Whether we're distinguished in this world because of achievement, or luck, our instincts and every reinforcement in our culture would have us believe that distinctions matter. And we reinforce that all the time. When I was working in the pharmaceutical industry, I used to cross the Atlantic Ocean every 10 days. And I was in first class, and that mattered to me that I wasn't back in the cattle car, you know, with the screaming baby next to the toilet, right? It mattered to me that when I got to the airport, I could go get a retinal scan and go right through without dealing with passport control. But did any of those perks, distinctions, which I wasn't paying for, did any of those change whether or not I arrived at the same destination as the guy in the back seat? sitting next to the toilet with the screaming baby beside him. You see, what mattered to me, really, at the time, was privilege, comfort. But privilege and comfort have nothing to do with where it is that we seek to go and whether we'll get there. Such earthly distinctions have no importance when we look at the bigger picture beyond this world, and then we see that it doesn't matter how special we may think ourselves to be, or even how others might see us, but that God considers us special enough to invite us into his kingdom and to pay the price for our admission. As I said, humility is not something we can just put on. I can't wake up on one fine morning and decide I'm going to be a humble person today any more than I can say today I will be a good person. I can try. We can choose to do good works. We can choose to do good in prayer. We can choose to strive against arrogance in attitude and practice, but at some point, it becomes clear that humility is more the unconscious effect of being humbled, and that true humility has nothing to do with being humbled before other men and women, but results rather from our being humbled before God in prayer, in penitence, on our knees even. Where we stand in the pecking order with other men and women is as irrelevant as the color of our eyes or the size of our bank accounts when compared to where we stand or kneel before God. In the gospel today, Jesus is invited to dine with the leader of the Pharisees. Now, the first thing to notice here is that our Lord shares table fellowship with those against whom his truth testifies. That simple action is one that we should not miss in an era when the church is threatened with various schisms by various disagreements over the authority of scripture and the theology of sin and redemption. There's a whole sermon there in Jesus' acceptance of the invitation to supper, but let's move on 
and look at what comes next. First, we're told that they were watching him. Who are they? The sentence structure really isn't clear, particularly in English, but in the context we can figure out that it's the Pharisees who are watching to see what Jesus will do. In the verses that are omitted from our lesson today, what Jesus does is heal a sick man on the Sabbath, asking the Pharisees if what he does is lawful on the Sabbath. They don't answer him. So he switches gears, shifting from examining his own behavior to looking at theirs, at how they have chosen places of honor at the table. Again, what Jesus does is as important as what he says. What he does is first examine his own behavior before looking at those around him. And this is a groundwork laid for the lesson in humility which Jesus then teaches. Humility does not involve being a doormat for Jesus Christ. It does not involve allowing yourself to be pushed around, to wallow in the pride of saying, what an humble man I am, sir. Humility involves, rather, a careful calibration of frame of reference, to recognize that the differences between the highest and the lowest in this world are nothing to God. Any one of us who has climbed a mountain will know that the vastness of scale and a long steep climb and of being able to finally look for many miles from the mountaintop is a big deal when we're standing there. But if you measure the greatest difference in height and depth on this earth between the almost six mile height of Mount Everest and the almost seven mile depth of the Marianas Trench at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, what you'll find is that the earth is actually smoother than a billiard ball that rolls so easily and precisely across a pool table. The differences between king and beggar are vast and important to the king and to the beggar, but not to God. To God, that distance in social and economic station is nothing and is a gap, therefore, which must be bridged. Bridged as taught by Jesus when he says, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. Invite the poor. Invite the crippled. Invite the lame. Invite the blind. In other words, invite the outcast, knowing that they are not cast out by God. They are not of low estate to God. And once we see that and live that, then we will be blessed. In Hebrews today, we're reminded that it's not just about good works to show hospitality to strangers, but to engage in mutuality in love and caring that is the antithesis of arrogance. It is easy for any one of us to say, for example, that, well, somebody's in prison, and so he must either be an evil person or dumb and could have made better choices, or however we describe that, or been a better person, and yet, our lesson enjoins that we are to remember those in prison as though we are in prison with them. Another frame of reference issue. To us, these are things that matter. There are things that people can do that mean that they should be imprisoned and punished. But when we compare ourselves to the holiness to which God calls us, then we see that we can claim no place of honor at the banquet, that we too fall short. Looking through God's eyes, we all fall short, and yet he still invites us to his banquet. He still invites us to share in his kingdom, pays the price for our failings, and equips us to enter into his joy. When we can realize all that God has done and does for us, then humility is no more and no less than our realization of our own common and 
anxiety and unworthiness as we shuffle along together in this world, in the line that seeks admission to the kingdom. And as we shuffle along, we find that we do not lower our heads in false humility. We do not cast our eyes down for lack of hope. For our Lord himself says to us, I will never leave you or forsake you. In the words of Hebrews and of the psalmist, we can then say in confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? What can anyone do to me indeed? But should I not ask what can I do? What must I do to anyone else? How can I continue in that mutual love shown to all by the Lord? And when I ask this question, do I not also learn that most humbling lesson that I can do nothing on my own but? In St. Paul's words in Philippians, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. I can do all things in him who strengthens me, in him described in Hebrews as Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And that's the one real frame of reference by which we can see that that which separates us from each other is but vain glory. There's a good old fashioned word for you. Vain glory. For this same Jesus, the same yesterday and today and forever is the same Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. And for what? For whom? For us. For you and for me, for the one who is the CEO of a Fortune 500 corporation in his private jet and for the one who sits in prison. If we can ever realize that, then humbleness and thankfulness are the only things we can feel. Humility and thanksgiving are the only ways by which and in which we can act, praying before God that one day we too may hear the invitation, friend, move up higher. Thanks be to God.